You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to macro historian Elise Bohan. I'm going to keep, as we're doing now, entertaining multiple possible future trajectories. There have to be multiple maps of reality in play for the future so that we're not taken aback when something novel emerges. Elise shared her thoughts on the importance of adopting a transhumanist worldview, why we live in a make or break century, and what is worth preserving about humanity. My thoughts on transhumanism have changed a lot over the last decade and a half. My first encounter with the movement was when I was 19 years old. If I'm completely honest, I had been reading a lot about the ancient Mayan prophecy that the world would end in 2012. I was an impressionable undergraduate student with an interest in ideas related to the future. Naturally, I gravitated towards a doomsday vision that looks set to have a massive impact on my life in the next few years. This investigation took me through the work of Daniel Pinchbeck, Terence McKenna, Peter Russell and James Lovelock. I don't exactly know how I arrived at transhumanism from this motley crew of new age and original thinkers, but I suspect it may have something to do with the fact that they were all loosely intersected with the LSD advocate Timothy Leary. During his time in prison, Leary had developed a futurist philosophy, Smile which stood for space migration, increased intelligence, and life extension. What's more, he was quite optimistic that many of these things would occur within his lifetime. Uh, They didn't. Uh, Leary wrote his Futurist Philosophy in 1976, but I found out that it would go on to inspire many of the core tenets of the 90s transhumanist movement, who believed that a combination of radical technologies including cryonics, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and artificial intelligence would be the key to humanity's future. With this new interest, I abandoned my interrogation of the 2012 phenomena and started to explore how technology might actually help us delay the end of the world. I got to meet my first real transhumanists in 2010 after I discovered that the World Transhumanist Association, recently renamed Humanity Plus, was still in existence. David Wood, a self-styled futurist famous for having developed the Symbian operating system that ran on the majority of Nokia phones at the time, had organised the Humanity Plus UK conference at the Humanist Centre Conway Hall, an event I eagerly attended. I had been given a small grant from the University of Warwick, where I was an undergraduate student, to shoot a documentary about some of these folk. In a weird sort of way, that documentary was the precursor of the Futures podcast. Thankfully, it never saw the light of day. One day I may consider releasing some of the audio from those interviews as a bonus episode, but we'll see. The great thing about the project is that it gave me the excuse to interview some of the leading figures of the transhumanist movement, including Natasha Vita Moore and Max Moore. Max was kind enough to give me an hour of his time to share his thoughts on cryonics. It's the first time I'd ever heard someone speak passionately and seriously about the concept of uh, human popsicles. I was hooked. I think that's what I've always loved and moreover respected about transhumanists. Their steadfast commitment to their personal visions of the future. It doesn't matter if they might ultimately be proved wrong, there is also a small possibility that they might actually be right. The older I've gotten, the more critical I've become of the more outlandish ideas that are associated with transhumanism, such as mind uploading. My podcast episode with Edward A. Lee goes into some depth about why I believe this might not be possible. But it's still always a joy to be in the presence of folk who truly believe that science and technology will guide our next stage of evolution. Transhumanists truly believe. One believer is Elise Bohan. She represents a next generation of the transhumanist movement who isn't afraid to confront the trickier aspects of its past. As you'll hear on this episode, we don't always agree with the direction of travel a transhumanist future will take us. But the value is in interrogating these possibilities as if there is a real chance they may come to pass. Doing so will help us to develop the foresight we will need to avoid the unintended consequences of pursuing such a superhuman future. So, spoiler alert, the world didn't end on December the 21st, 2012, but, as Elise points out in this episode, it's more important than ever to explore all the options we have available to us in this make-or-break century. 
Doomsday is still constantly around the corner, but that doesn't mean it needs to be inevitable. So it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce you to my friend, Elise Bohan. Your new book, Future Superhuman, really tackles this concept of transhumanism. So I feel like I have to ask the question of what is transhumanism? Yeah, sure. So transhumanism is basically a philosophy and a social movement that goes back formally to roughly the year 1990. And it's all about extending those core principles of enlightenment humanism, where we want to use science and reason and education and cultural tools to improve the human condition to bring out the better angels of our nature. But transhumanists, they kind of, they have a bolder vision. They want to take it one step further and use the best of modern science and technology to radically extend the parameters of what it means to be human, to push up against all of those biological boundaries, push back against things like aging, disease, mortality, extend human health spans, And enhance human intelligence is a really, really big facet of those aspirations. Well, would you happily describe yourself as a transhumanist? Yeah, I think that basically the core ideals of trying to bring about a good life for as many people as possible, and particularly when that centers around enhancing intelligence and enhancing our ability to understand and solve problems in the world, that's a core sort of philosophy that I'm really on board with. In terms of the diversity of the transhumanist movement, there are so many people with so many different goals and aspirations and projects. So it's not that I would necessarily subscribe to every project, whether that might be cryonic suspension, freezing your head in a vat of liquid nitrogen, for example. But yeah, basically the idea of being the best that we can be and ameliorating as much suffering in the world as possible. Does it always necessarily have to be about being better, enhancing yourself, or could a transhumanist project be about living a differentiated way in this world? Yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. And I've thought about that really deeply. It doesn't necessarily have to be about being better. And then we, of course, we have the question of by what definition of better and who (laughs) gets to decide. But I think there are some objective things that we can sort of pinpoint that basically if we strip away the idea of radical enhancement and radical transcendence, almost everybody sort of agrees. Well, It would be good not to fall apart and die prematurely. It would be good not to get cancer or heart disease, for example. It'd be really great not to watch your parents or your grandparents succumb to things like Alzheimer's and dementia and spend, you know, a lot of time of life not in a state of good health, sort of more suffering from sick care and heavily medicalized aged care. I think most of us sort of think, well, there probably is a better when we're thinking about that condition of existence and less suffering and less disease would be good. So I think there are a a bunch of aspects of life where you could kind of go, well, would more abundance be good in terms of economic growth? Would it be good for people to have more resources to be able to work less? Again, I think that that's something that a lot of people basically sort of nod along with and think, yeah, it would be terrific. So it's kind of the idea of extending very humanistic projects like disease amelioration and solving for poverty and really being open to how far you can push that in the modern world. I mean, no one would argue against the sorts of technologies that would allow us to live healthier lives, but you flirt in Future Superhuman, you flirt with some of the more radical visions for what a potential human being could be. So if we were to to look at some of the, the wilder fringes of transhumanism and argue for some of those, what are some of the, the visions that really excite you? I think anything that involves radical augmentation of intelligence. The title of my book is Future Superhuman. So any sort of post-human superhuman visions, AI is really at the crux of a lot of those visions. So the idea that we could potentially design machines that match and then exceed human capabilities and then put that intelligence to work, solving complex problems in the modern world, that excites me beyond belief in no small part because the modern world is so replete Mm. with an unprecedented number of existential risks and challenges. We have never had 
more human generated risks and dangers on our plate to juggle in this complex global civilization. So I'm talking about things like nuclear weapons, the risk of bioengineered pathogens, AI itself, obviously, <laughs> being one of the emerging risk categories. And of course, climate change. That's a big one where we can sort of see this iceberg on the horizon for humanity. And we've had decades of information kind of flooding in, nudging us to kind of go, right, we have finite time here. We need to take action. We need to be preemptive on this, this issue. And we have seen humanity fail time and time again. <laughs> to pick up that ball, which doesn't bode well, I think, for our long-term thinking and our long-term problem-solving skills. So in a world where we had not only more intelligence, because I think that can be a really crude vision where we sort of just imagine these very utilitarian, soulless bots making spreadsheety type decisions that, you know, that lack all compassion, lack all nuance. The idea that you've got greater than human levels of intelligence, but that it can be put to use solving the deepest challenges of our age. I think that that is something not only to be looked forward to, but something that's going to be necessary in the human future. I do have to ask what the obsession with intelligence is. It's always when mm. I come to somewhere like the University of Oxford, where we're <laughs> recording this now, uh, when you have these future looking conversations, intelligence is always the one that comes up. Mm. Uh, famously, uh, actually, I think it's Anders Sandberg who's, who's sitting in the office next door. I think he famously said, well, you know, most of the folks who talk about the enhancement of intelligence, they see their bodies purely as the transportation systems for their brains. <laughs> All they really care about is the thing that's contained within their skull and enhancing that because they've spent a life inside of academia that values intelligence. And surely the question we need to ask is what sort of values do we need in the 21st century? And then based on that value set, decide what we should then enhance or amplify. Yeah. The problem is you still need the capacity to make sound decisions <laughs> with an emphasis, not on heads in jars here, but with an emphasis on real world outcomes. Again, I think we can all concretely agree that challenges like climate change, challenges mm. like the risk of nuclear proliferation and nuclear war do require intelligence in which to, to juggle those very complex, very thorny issues. And in terms of values being relative yes to some extent that they are but to sort of to sort of whitewash intelligence away as just mm. this this thing that's only prized by ivory tower academics because mm. that's where they get their kicks or that's where they get their ego boost i do think there's some truth to that narrative and i do think there is some danger of over associating your, your identity with intelligence mm. to the extent that you become siloized and unaware of broader facets to life and broader aspects of the richness of human experience. And I think in particular, sensory embodied forms of experience have deep beauty, profoundly enrich uh, human experience and mm -hmm. deeply enmeshed in our capacity to bond, communicate and love in ways uh, that cannot be whitewashed by someone sort of saying, I'm a head in a jar only, my brain is divorced from my body. I think it is all part of this very complex system that drives, I guess, the better and worse angels of our nature, the two sides of humanity. We have seen in recent history that humans struggle to be on the same page. We're probably struggling more than ever to have a common sense of a core reality, a common origin story, a common set of beliefs and, and cultural values. I think it is, I hesitate to say a bridge too far, but the idea that 8 billion people are going to cohere on a core vision for the future, I don't think is realistic. Mm. That said, I do think that there needs to be democratic elements to the process. It's one of the reasons that I do think we need better stories about some of the more challenging ideas of our age to even talk cogently about things like AI reaching and exceeding human intelligence and maybe disrupting lots and lots of facets of our lives. Mm. So whether that be our employment prospects, our dating and mating lives, the global demographic situation, global fertility rates. There are so many forms of disruption that we could say uh, AI impacting our world with. We are not going to be able to make any decisions about any facet of that disruption if we're still at the stage as a collective mm -hmm. where 
we sort of seize up at the mention of it. We sort of either just laugh it off and throw it in the sci-fi bin of <laughs> we have that sort of relieved laughter of that's silly, that's really far out, that's never going to happen, or the more defensive reaction I think we're starting to see more of, which is, oh, I don't like this. Oh, if you're talking about this, mm-hmm. you, you must be one of those baddies. Uh-oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very confronted. I would like you to please stop talking now. I think it's really important that we keep talking, but are able to acknowledge this is one of the most confronting stories and potential realities that humanity has ever faced. The idea that within our lifetimes, within the 21st century, Mm. humanity will reach a level of technological maturity where they are able to potentially seed their own successes or what the roboticist Hans Moravec called mind children. Mm. That is not what any flesh and blood human being wants to hear because we have evolved (laughs) on the African savannah to live lives that were the same as our parents' and grandparents' lives, where technological change happened really, really slowly, Mm -hmm. where your expectations were kind of baked in from day one and you didn't have the rug pulled from under your feet. You didn't face this sudden cascade of threats to your sense of identity, your sense of purpose, your livelihood, everything that you've kind of invested in in life. And it behooves us, I think, really to acknowledge that that rug pull psychologically is one of the toughest things Mm. that all of us stand to face in our lifetimes. And I'm not saying here, you know, it's guaranteed that AI is going to do this or that or become super intelligent by this date or in this century. I'm saying it's a strong enough possibility that we need to be able to narrativize it. We need to be able to talk about it. We need to be able to entertain policies that allow for some of this disruption, particularly in the short term, you know, things like universal basic income, things that speak to what people are going to do if they're displaced en masse from the workforce and not only how they'll be remunerated, but how they'll find a sense of meaning and purpose. Speaking with you, Elise, it always feels like it's transhumanism or bust. Like <laughs> either, either we pick transhumanism or we're all fundamentally doomed. And I think that's encapsulated by uh, a phrase that you mentioned in your, in your book, which is the idea that the 21st century is a make or break century. So what do you mean by that? And what implications does that have for the sorts of decisions that we make as we travel through the 21st century, hopefully into the 22nd? I do think, give or take a century or two, right, we're talking sort of orders of magnitude here within the realm of a few hundred years, but very plausibly this century, we are juggling enough of those big existential risks we talk, talked about mm-hmm. that we're in all likelihood not going to be able to see our way through just sort of maintaining a a 2022 level of status quo reality. I mean, the fact that we've sat on nuclear weapons for roughly 70 years sort of seems to reassure some people. It's like, yeah, yeah, okay, we can we can put that <laughs> in the back of our mind. That's that's all fine now. And the reality is we've had so many near misses. We're in a geopolitical situation mm-hmm. right now of sort of Cold War resurgent tensions. And the idea that humanity can sit on nukes alone for hundreds thousands of years without anything going particularly wrong, I think is is optimistic. But what makes this century really unique is that we're adding new and more powerful technologies at a faster rate. And they're the kind of technologies that are different to nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons are really expensive. They're hard to make and only state actors have ever produced them. The same is not true of bioengineered pathogens and bioweapons particularly with the aid of more computing power and AI, we are on the threshold of an age where someone with PhD level training and basic lab kit (laughs) can bring back smallpox or uh, tweak the bubonic plague Mm. to bring us pathogens that are as able to spread as something like uh, measles, which maybe infects 16 people for every one person who's infectious, that are airborne, but that may have the lethality of something like Ebola or HIV. So this is a new dawn (laughs) in biotechnology. And then, of course, we're adding more and more into the mix. We're adding artificial intelligence, which is a whole other can of worms in terms of incredible promise, right, to to do all those things like cure diseases, solve problems, allow humanity to create more abundance by producing more goods through efficient manufacturing and farming, could definitely stave off issues around 
famine and resource scarcity, that would be a wonderful boon for the species. But of course, keeping it under control is really, really <laughs> difficult. Well, well it, it does sound like we need technological progress to mitigate against the negative effects of technological progress. It's kind of the devil's bargain that we're dealing with. I guess that's best encapsulated by Elon Musk, who's so scared of AI and yet at the same time has his own humanoid AI Tesla project, whether we know that that's vaporware or not, he's still creating the future that he fears, which is incredible marketing in many ways. <laughs> Self-fulfilling prophecies, a bitch. Uh, and that is, is, is that encapsulated. So how do we deal with the fact that we have individuals like Elon Musk who are able to operate at scale over the sorts of futures that might be available to us? I think the the phrase I'd love to signal boost here is perverse incentives. <laughs> <laughs> not not targeted specifically at Elon here, uh -huh. but I think it targeted at, you know, the the big thing I, I foreground in the book is the idea of the ape brain, right? That we're we've almost out our rather our environment has almost outgrown us. Mm. We're not really evolved for this situation of eight billion humans with these complex global supply chains, with these incredibly complex technologies, with these thinking machines that we're building. And what's happening with AI, and Elon's one example, but there are many others, what's happening is basically that the incentives to double down on rapid R&D that can generate billions, if not trillions of mm. dollars in global wealth. That incentive is so strong. It is so such a bankable technology and it's so bankable as well because it's a general purpose technology, mm. very much like electricity. Like electricity is something that almost became banal because we, we put it everywhere. We infused it in every gadget, every technology. It's in our built environments. And that's the way that AI is going. So you can imagine the huge economic boons that could be unleashed as we apply it to healthcare, education, obviously computer science, supply chains, logistics, you name it. Mm. We'll pack AI in there. It's, it's uh, ironic with many of the conversations I have on the Futures podcast, specifically about AI, that it's seen as this massive opportunity and yet also at the same time, this massive threat. And then the solution for it being a massive threat to, you know, the, the famous one is a threat to our jobs is, well, we'll just integrate AI into the human. We'll make a techno-human hybrid, the cyborg with the neural link attached to their brain so they can download information directly from the internet. And, and that presupposes that the values we have are purely tied to the job market. That the only reason we would want an AI directly drilled into our minds is because it gives us some sort of advantage, not in the world, but in the market, which is an artificial construction in its own right. So it goes back again to that question of uh, what is it we truly are amplifying? Are we amplifying the sorts of things we think will be valuable in the future, based on an environment and a value set that we've created, which is based on market economics, or is it truly about amplifying these things that make human beings so special? Because it feels like the more we technologically enable the human being, the, the less we see the human as this, this special entity. The problem with AI is that we know so little about how it reaches the conclusions it does when we're using deep learning neural nets, how it autonomously operates in the world, mm. and how it may or may not misinterpret human commands, particularly as it gets more intelligent and has more autonomy. This is exactly the double-edged sword that we face, that we have enough of it in our world to have created these big problems that we can't seem to solve with our eight brains. Mm. So what do we need? We need more minds. We need cleverer, more objective, more rational minds than our own. We build them, but of course they're an outgrowth of our own minds mm. and we may very much encode some profound errors <laughs> well, that, <laughs> into that, those that, that's the great irony. children. That's the great irony in what you said there. It's like, so we, we have these, these eight brained humans creating these sorts of technologies that are going to bring us into the future. And yet the fundamental flaw is that it's eight brained humans that are creating these technologies. So, so what makes you believe that we're on the correct trajectory? Surely we need to enhance our intelligence first before we 
find the technologies that are going to create the future intelligence. We're, we're basing this on a on a human that has so many flaws. Yeah, to be clear, I don't necessarily think we're on the right trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're in a, I mean, make or break century. We are uh -huh. in a, we're in a danger zone here. Yeah. If we dwell too much on the danger zone, we're at risk of paralyzing everybody around us. We're at risk of that, the same problem with climate change. If we go too hard down the doom and gloom story, then people feel hopeless. It's inept. We shut down. And I don't think that's where we're at. I do think that there are things that we can do, but the landscape is changing so fast. The technology is so complex. Mm -hmm. Keeping on top of it as it evolves and knowing what to do next it is a really daunting challenge. I don't think we should lie about that. I don't think we should lie about the fact that some of the smartest minds in the world are working on this issue and they are kind of at times beating their head against a brick wall going, oh shit, this is, mm. this is terrifying. I, I don't know what's coming next. But the next step isn't to shut down and have a meltdown. The next step is to go, okay, I'm going to keep studying this phenomenon. I'm going to keep thinking about where it might go. I'm going to keep, as we're doing now, entertaining multiple possible future trajectories. Yeah. There have to be multiple maps of reality in play for the future so that we're not taken aback when something novel emerges. My challenge is with, and look, I'm pro-progress in, in many ways and, and very much pro-transhumanism, uh, but my challenge becomes it all feels like it's a byproduct of sitting within the Anthropocene. So it used to be that environment and biology would define humanity. And we're in this unique moment in the 21st century, this, this moment that you describe as this, this potential tipping point in the 21st century, where for the first time ever, humanity has the ability to define environment and biology. And to turn a phrase, with great power comes great responsibility. But it feels like we don't have again, to your point, the intelligence to make the right sorts of decisions over what sorts of environments and what sorts of biology that we want to create. So if everything is available, if there's a multitude of possibilities, our struggle is about which road to go down. And often what ends up happening is somebody either has the, the financial availability to create their own uh, individualist version of what they believe should be the trajectory we should go down. And it's not something that we agree with collectively. So for example, we wouldn't need to enhance our intelligence through AI if we didn't believe that the workforce of the future is going to become, or the human workforce of the future is going to become obsolete based on AI. The only reason we have that bedtime story about being able to enhance our intelligence with AI and becoming these techno-human hybrids is because we believe that's the only way to stay competitive. I don't think that's true at all. No? Uh, no. Yeah. Um, no, particularly at the vanguard of the folks who are really at the helm of developing this technology mm -hmm. and garnering funding for this research. I don't think... They think, I mean, they they are often champions of universal basic income and sort of saying the last thing humanity needs is to cleave its identity yeah. to jobs. The idea that we need to plug in so that we can compete in an economic landscape where AI stands to generate trillions of dollars yeah. of, of GDP and render it more possible to live in a world of abundance that is decoupled where like our standards of living are decoupled from the amount of labor that we bring to the global economy. Uh, I, I don't think that's it at all. I think the idea, certainly my, my reason for thinking that AI is something that humanity is going to need in spite of the risks, mm -hmm. and I think that's still uncomfortable to me, but <laughs> that's where I'm sitting at the moment, is those existential risks that we talked about before, that without something smarter, without something helping us do geoengineering or carbon capture or whatever it happens to be and developing more robust global systems of diplomacy and democracy, then I don't think we're going to sit on the technologies of today and mm -hmm. certainly not of tomorrow for hundreds or thousands of years into the future. It's just not realistic. But the other reason that many people are sort of excited about 
I suppose, yeah, you've taken the Neuralink example of, you know, plugging our brains into AI. That there's many, there's many ways that we could have an AI saturated world. That's mm -hmm. one of the sort of most popular signal boosted ones in the media. The idea that again, it's a sort of a classic transhumanist idea of solving diseases, allowing people to have more eudaimonia, live longer in a state of good health and use those years to do all the things we love most about being human, to connect with our loved ones, not in a state of infirmity, to mm -hmm. have our faculties about us, to be present, to be able to enjoy the rich sensory experiences of the world. I think a lot of people who are bullish on AI are excited about it for its potential to allow us to live longer, to get more out of a human existence in a very age-old human way. So, so in your mind, the only way is through? I definitely say that in the postscript of the book. <laughs> the only way out is through. But again, I am very uncomfortable with that declaration. That is not a zealous, yeah, throw humanity in the bin. We're going to upgrade. It's all going to be terrific. Don't even worry. Yeah. My message is we should definitely worry keep our wits about us, like think very carefully about the problems. The only way we're going to solve that is with the collective intelligence of a bunch of humans really thinking carefully a bit about confronting risks and challenges and also about the opportunities on our plate with these advanced technologies and utilizing them to try and solve complex problems. And I think one of the reasons we hate that story mm -hmm. and we hate that prospect because it sounds like really hard work. It's like we've got to think really hard and we might fail and the challenges are really complex. Can't I just go back to watching reality TV and kicking back and just, you know, doing a bit of slacktivism on Twitter? Uh -huh. uh, and not really, no. The only way out is through. Listening to you speak there, it sounds like you're not just a transhumanist, but you're an accelerationist. You know, in your mind, this stuff has to happen now and it has to happen as soon as possible. W would you agree with that statement? No, I mean, <laughs> 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 no, I'm definitely not an accelerationist, but I am torn. I'm very much in two minds. Mm. There is that question and a lot of the AI safety community is mulling over the same question, right? Do we slow it down or do we speed it up? Yeah. And I think it's dubious that we're really in control of either. Again, sort of when we signal boost the idea of who's who's deciding what the future is, the billionaires will just go on and invent the AI according to their standards and their desires. I think that gives, again, humanity way too much credit and <laughs> humans way too much agency in the story of history and evolution. Uh -huh. We know that it's, <laughs> it's microbes, it's plate tectonics. It's the availability of domesticable crops that have determined so much of the course of history over time, things that humans haven't really been in control of. So if we think about other big revolutions in human history, mm. particularly the, the transition from paleolithic lifeways to agrarian lifeways, it wasn't like all of our hunter-gatherer ancestors like had a tribal council meeting and they all sat down and they were like, right, see those crops over there? What if we collect the seeds, we plant yeah. them and we just build huts here? And instead of being nomadic, we'll be sedentary. We'll do this thing called farming and yeah. it'll be terrific. And, you know, some guy was really trying to sell it to them and get them on board. They did it because their environment changed, their yeah. niche changed. Um, and it became the more adaptive way of life for people in lots of regions of the world. It was an adaptive way of life. And then, you know, a couple of thousand years later into Monsanto and then they genetically modify crops and you can only use their forms of crops. And it doesn't, it makes it so that the soil gets all its nutrients sucked from it. And there's no such thing as circular, circular farming anymore. And we right. deal with these climate crises. You know, it's all good intentions. And so suddenly it's, it's not to your point, the perverse incentives suddenly come into play. Mm -hmm. So what's stopping us as we uh, continue down that that path of progress, let's call it, from polluting these, these uh, ambitions with certain forms of perverse incentive? Well, I have to, I have to push back first of, first of all on pesticides. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. It's like modern agriculture has enabled the 8 billion humans on the planet to, to be here today. Yeah. So yes, there are perverse incentives in corporate realities. There has been a lot of pollution. There have been negative consequences of agriculture and industrialization, very famously. We do yeah. know this. And as I say in the book, in many ways, we are like the children of the industrial revolution. Uh -huh. They're air shrouded in smog, working in mines, like 
lives upended in ways that, you know, yeah. w- were a rug pull for the people of the 19th century as much as our rug pulls are felt that way for us today in different ways. So, yeah, there are always trade-offs. And I think as you're rightly highlighting that, there are always unforeseen consequences yeah. of these big paradigm shifts. Again, I don't think our, our hunter-gatherer ancestors had a clear concept of we're transitioning to agriculture now the way we sort of have a clear concept of the information age or a transhuman era. Mm. But um, my message is a hard one to swallow there, is that we're not going to decide on advance in advance how this plays out. We don't know enough and it's happening too fast. This is one of the things that makes this transition even more scary and even more of as I say, make or break than any of the other transitions in human history. Well, this is the the weird inconsistency I find from the transhumanist movement when they describe transhumanism. So for some, it's about fixing things, i.e. fixing, repairing, ensuring humans can live longer or, or fixing our, our uh, limitations of our intelligence. But for others, it's about fixing things, holding what the human is in this special moment in time and space, i.e. looking at the 21st century human being and going, you know what, more of that please. So I'm going to cryogenically freeze the human as it exists now in the assumption that it will continue ad infinitum, or I'm going to continuously replace this human being with different biological inputs or, or prosthetics and body parts so that it maintains some form of consistency, or I'm going to take that human brain as it exists now and upload it into a computer so that this form of human being can live on ad infinitum. It's less about being open to the multitude of possibilities for what the human could become, because that's when posthumanism comes into the frame. It's like, well, this could be radically different from the human we have now. So of those two different visions of transhumanism, which one do you feel most at home with? The idea that 21st century human is a thing that's worth preserving, but preserving indefinitely into the future, or 21st century human is something that we should kind of use as the prototype for whatever we may become in the near future? Definitely the latter, the prototype (laughs) for what we become. I don't think fixing in rigid terms is realistic. Uh I don't think many transhumanists subscribe to that, but I do know that the flavor of transhumanism that you're talking about there, Mm -hmm. I think you put it really beautifully. I love that idea of fixing and fixing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's, It's a terrific way of putting it. I think when I was younger, when I first encountered transhumanist ideas, there was more, you know, you find more of this sort of in media clickbait and things like that. There is more of a signal boosting of the the razzle dazzle stories that mm. are like, upload your brain, live forever, transcend. But you know the idea that you're still you, but you get to sort of bootstrap and come along for the ride. Mm. I don't think it's even remotely plausible that a post human being, whether you know maybe we have integrated in some sense with artificial super intelligence, mm. that thing is so far beyond us. It would have altered all of our aspects, all of our cognitive landscape to a point where it's utterly unrecognizable. You can't add orders of magnitude more intelligence into the system mm. and interface with silicon intelligence and and still be you in the same way, not quite in the same way, but in a cruder way. You know, I don't think five-year-old Elise is still with us. I mm. think we, we die many times over and <laughs> the idea, there is continuity, we, you know, philosophers talk about patternism and, you know, the fact that that memories and patterns of experience kind of survive within the brain over time. Mm. I think that's a really interesting idea because I still have memories, whether they're accurate or not, from five-year-old Elise. There's still a sense that I was once her, mm. but I'm very clearly also not her. <laughs> she She's not here in this room today in, in, in every sense, in a literal sense. Uh-huh. The atoms in my body are different. Yeah. You know, I think it's transhumanism is often accused of, you know, is it a quasi religion? Is it a religion for tech geeks? Is it really all just about bringing back this vision of immortality, Mm. but not a kind of more poetic immortality where some nebulous aspects survive, but the idea that I, me, the ego Mm. survives. Yeah, I find that idea less interesting than ever and, and kind of distracting because. 
I just don't think that that's can happen or will happen. I mean, the idea of whole brain emulation, for anyone who's familiar with that, the idea of, you know, using an electron microscope to precisely scan every aspect of a human brain and replicate it. The minute that that consciousness wakes up and starts engaging in thought, engaging with the world, its mm. experiences diverge from the original. And you can talk about destructive uploading where, okay, the, the original doesn't survive, but I feel that's a bit of a minefield. So mm. I won't deep dive too hard into that. But the future that I think it's not necessarily what am I most interested in, but I think we should be talking about the things that are most probable and most practical. And with that mindset of, as you say, fixing things, solving problems in the world, mm. the values that we have today, you know, we've talked about values a bunch. I think, again, there are some really common values that basically all of humanity shares. And the idea that we want some sense of sustainability, we don't want extinction, we don't want the things we know and love about humanity to be wiped out. I don't think any of us are particularly keen on the idea of there not being intelligent life mm. on this planet anymore or in the universe anymore. So the idea that we fix the very real very immediate challenges that we have. And I'm not saying that'll be done and dusted easy, but we turn our minds to it and we make that the priority of our age. Mm. That's the transhumanism I'm interested in. And I don't think the label is even necessarily helpful there. It's really just about using the best modern tools, whatever they happen to be, to deal with the challenges that are on your plate. But I think what's useful as a mindset is to be the kind of thinker that can look at the short, medium and long range horizons in concert. I think humans are really apt to pick something that they like, and usually it's the short-term horizon, roughly the next 10 years, but often the next few hours, the next few months. Am I getting promoted this year? I, me, mine. Um, and I think we need to be able to balance our needs in the immediate present with the needs of the next few decades, the next few centuries, and then ideally the next few millennia, because the the amount of intelligent life that could exist if we mm. get this right, if we make it through this century. We're talking trillions of possible people in the future. Is that even possible to live in those three different time zones simultaneously? It's Be hard. Well, it's, it's hard, but we've already proven the fact that we clearly as a society care more about what's going to happen tomorrow mm. and today than we do about what's going to happen in a millennia. I mean, that's just evidenced by our consumption habits. <laughs> We're sitting here with plastic water bottles in front of us. You know, we made those decisions today. Yeah. Uh, you know, hopefully there'll be some technology in the future that will deal with that plastic problem that we have. You know, th this idea that we can discount our decision making today in the hope that some form of future technology will save us from the stupid decisions we made in our present seems both empowering and, and deeply disempowering. And what if there isn't something that's going to help us in the, in the future and provide us with the safety net that we so desperately think we're going to be able to build once we just get slightly more intelligent? Yeah, there may not be. And again, I think, <laughs> <laughs> be real. I, yeah. I, I think like <laughs> the belief that we are going to be able to build the forms of intelligence that will help us solve the problem, uh, as we've as we've been talking about, that is a, that is yeah. a really open question. There's lots that could go wrong, but again, I'm more interested in foregrounding what is likely to be true and what challenges we are going to have to face realistically. Mm -hmm. So if we go back and talk about. I think you're dead right, and I argue this quite strongly in the book, that the biggest impediment to us solving global sustainability challenges in the 21st century is our ape brains, is humanity itself, which again is not to say we loathe humanity, we want to put it in the bin, it's we love the best of humanity so much, but look at us struggling in this complex system that we've built that's kind of run ahead of our ability to map it and understand it and rein it in. And so just realistically, we have to talk about the fact that the ape brain is almost an X risk category in itself. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't follow from there, right? Okay, so the ape brain is struggling. We've got to build new brains. We've got technology, so we will definitely use that 
to cobble something together and it'll be fine doesn't follow at all. It may mm. very well play out, again, make or break century, that humanity faffs about, we get mired in our short-term thinking and our perverse incentives, we fail to build safe and robust AI, whether that's because we fail to get to strong AI at all or whether that's because we succeed and we do it in a really dangerous fashion. Mm. This is a high stakes juggling act. But again, I just don't think we can afford at this late hour to be lying to ourselves about the gravity of the challenge that we face. It just makes me slightly sad. Well, two things make me slightly sad. Firstly, that your inner child is dead. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the first concern that I have for you. And the, the second concern I have is that when, when you talk about the human in that way, and this is where a lot of transhumanists start, they go, you know, we're weak. We've got these eight brains. It would be so much better if we were enabled by technology. We so quickly fall into this self-esteem crisis. You know, human beings are absolutely awesome in so many ways. And yet to argue for a transhumanist future, you have to begin with the premise that in actual fact, we're not that great. You know, something is wrong with us, whether it's our the fact that we die or the fact that we're not strong enough or the fact that we're not intelligent enough. So we end up kind of beating ourselves up, putting ourselves in this self-esteem crisis. And then when we end up in the 21st century is in a mindset of, you know what, it would just be better off if we weren't here in the first place. You know, it'd be a blessing if we just blipped off of planet Earth and that some other form of intelligence came and replaced us. I mean, you have to argue it just a little bit for what's wonderful about humanity. And I think the question I'm asking, Lisa, is what is worth preserving? There's a risk of making humanity seem there like the kind of emo teenager in the basement, like we're thinking about 21st century life ways in this really ineffectual way and then we're just sort of like hiding under the blankets because it's all all yeah. too hard. We're, we're told we caused the problem. Yeah, but then think about what you were just- Or we are the problem. <laughs> right, but but maybe- we can be both, right? Maybe we can be part of the problem huh. in a system that's really, really complex where we've got flaws that make up some aspects of our human nature a liability, but we've also got incredible attributes and assets that can help us be part of the solution too. I think that both of those portraits of humanity can coexist very, very comfortably. So think about what you were saying earlier, right, about the human short-termism. Look at all these perverse incentives. Mm. Look at this spiral into vapid forms of capitalism that suck people into, you know, less than ideal unimpeachable behaviours. Mm. I think you've already sort of signal boosted in this conversation that there are aspects of humanity that are kind of failing us. And when we sort of talk about the human ability to build these machines, you're sort of foregrounding, yeah, but look at us. What what if we trip up? What if we fail? Mm. What if we're not even smart enough to build these machines we think they're going to be so useful? You're absolutely right that our propensity for short-termism is dangerous. And I don't think it's having low self-esteem to admit that. I think it's being honest. I think it mm. just has an even-handed evolutionary view of how humanity fits into the broader complex system that it's created. But in terms of what we go on and do with that, I think there's incredible hope. So to to bring it around to what you were really sort of driving at, what's so great about humanity? What do we want to preserve? Mm. Some of the things are things that we share with other conscious creatures, starting with consciousness, our ability to have a sense of our existence in the world, to be self-reflexive, that allows us to have experiences that I think at least within our anthropocentric perspective, we would consider richer, deeper and more beautiful than say what a cockroach or a bacterium experiences, at least what we expect they would experience. It is a remarkable privilege to be a human being dancing around on this planet in the sun for however long we get. Mm -hmm to be able to unravel some of the workings of the natural world, to, again, signal boost intelligence here, to begin the journey of knowing thyself and through knowing thyself, knowing others, the exploration of psychology, of cognitive science, mm. how we are able to commune with each other in ways that are just 
can be at their best transcendently beautiful. And that can be instantiated in the physical world when we make love to a partner, when we have Mm. a beautiful conversation with our deepest friends and family members, when we hold our children in our arms. But it can also be instantiated through space and time because we are a storytelling animal. We have this Mm. incredible ability to travel through time, to tell stories that connect us to minds long dead. And we at least think that this is a really, really beautiful thing and that it could be the seed, I think, of even more beautiful forms of experience, conscious connection and exploration in the future. So if we're so great, why are you so obsessed with hoping that we find out we're just like machines? <laughs> if, it, if, if all of that is true, if we are these special creatures individual from anything else in nature or anything else that we can make, why is so much of the focus in some of the transhumanist, perhaps transhumanist, maybe posthumanist technologies that you're mentioning on seeing the human as not special as just some other container for intelligence and we can create this thing externally from the human being? Why are we so quick to discount all those things when it comes to talking about future technologies or techno-human hybrids. Why can't we just sit back and enjoy what it means to be human as opposed to be like, yeah, you know, all these wonderful things, this storytelling thing is great, but it would be cooler if I could storytell with a prosthetic limb. (laughs) <laughs> once again, once again, two things can both be true. All right. Right? So we can we can have incredible abilities that are really really beautiful, mm-hmm. that are enriching, that we revere. Yeah. And we can say that this is unlike anything that's ever emerged on earth and that's remarkable. But it doesn't follow as, as any evolutionist will tell you. It doesn't follow that that means we go kick back and go right. Clearly, We've reached the pinnacle of evolutionary yeah. potential. Job done. I mean, we, we really can't improve on this. This is, <laughs> this is just, this is where it's at, guys. Yeah. I mean, again, as I say in, in the book, I stand by all the beautiful things that I've highlighted about human nature. And yet we are the species that enslaves each other by the millions. Mm. That has got, as we speak, 7 billion chickens Mm. in factory farmings living in in farms living in conditions of abject torture right now we are the species that mutilates by the hundreds of millions the genitals mm. of young girls like the idea that we've got it sorted and that we don't need to think about self improvement is patently absurd to me mm-hmm. but again the to the real question that brings it round to transhumanism why can't we just kick back why can't we just enjoy what we've got it's a nice idea. And there's a, I think there's a romantic part of me and so many people in the world today, as we, you know, face all these complex global challenges, there's this resurgence of nostalgia for the past, this mm. looking back to an age where we had things we feel like we're losing in an age of digitization and atomization. So community, family, connection. Uh, I think people are hungry for at the very least, a romantic vision of what they think it was like in the past. Mm-hmm. And I think there were there's still were some positive instantiations of that. And some things just came easier by virtue of the fact that you had larger families, there was less atomization. Always trade-offs come with that, right? Mm. <laughs> a lot of a lot of suffering attached to some of those arrangements. But the reason that we can't just go, right, freeze it all here, let's re-engage with the most beautiful aspects of ancient cultures and human traditions that really do help us feel fulfilled in our ingrained biological impulses that are sort of being stymied in various ways by our modern built environments. Again, the reason why even if we want to, and in in many ways it's sad, even if we want to, we can't freeze it here, Mm. is again that risk ante. Well, we have put progress on pause previously. I mean, you just look at proliferation of nuclear weapons, the very fact that we haven't used them means means we've put that form of progress on pause, partly because the stakes are so incredibly high. You know, that's game over. Well, I mean, the the stockpile of nuclear weapons globally has declined, but we've gone from a handful of state actors possessing them to nine state actors (laughs) possessing them and counting. Uh And again, I just, I have to remind you, 70 years with multiple major near misses and two detonations of nuclear weapons 
it's not a great track record. It doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. And, and as we've said, nukes are one risk category that we have to sit on. We're quickly racking up multiple other risk categories that we also have to keep in check, not just for another 70 years, but in perpetuity. Mm. And that just is no longer a realistic prospect. Well, it feels like as, as we're speaking, we're talking about two things here. One, which is at the human level, which is the human story, the story of us. And then the second thing is the big picture, you know, us in time and space and the environment around us. And when we're thinking about technological progress, transhumanism, how do we hold those two in balance? How can we think about both at the same time without going crazy or spending hours on a podcast? It's really hard. And I think the, <laughs> the reason the reason I wrote the second half of my book as the human story and uh-huh. really brought it back to earth, really brought it back to, okay, forget all the make or break stuff. Mm. It's there, but like- I know what you most want to hear about is- Sex robots. Well, (laughs) often anything to do with sex, but how advanced technologies are directly standing to impact or already impacting the stuff you care about in your everyday life. So work, healthcare, sex, dating, mating, procreation, all the kind of bread and butter human stuff. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that by talking honestly, trying to talk through some of the less- explored future prospects there, we can start mapping out, again, stories of possible futures that seem more tangible, more close to home, more realistic. Maybe they're not always comfortable, but I think it's through the lens of those stories that people can start to make the links between the technologies that maybe are changing their job prospects or hacking their children's brains on Instagram or whatever it might be to, oh, okay, that AI thing is also doing this other stuff that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I see how it is all part of this larger idea of this species in transition, these technologies that are simultaneously, I guess, upending multiple different facets of our lives. But yeah, to how to hold both of those stories I don't think we can really hold them front of mind all the time. I think our default mode is short term. But to try and prize open Mm. (laughs) that time window just a little bit further and encourage people to look a little bit farther, I think also the idea of a make or break century helps because it's the idea that a lot of this stuff stands to happen in your lifetime. So it's not, oh, okay, your grandchildren might have to worry about climate change or your grandchildren might have to worry about nuclear Mm. war. Oh, actually, no, you do. This could change your life and your world and upend everything you care about. And once you have a personal buy-in, once you have skin in the game, I like to think there is the risk of paralysis, but I do like to think that some people will at least mobilise in the face of that. It does feel like individually we don't have a lot of agency over the sorts of futures we're going to get. The future is not a thing that we do. It's a thing that happens to us. So is there anything, unless we end up in an AI research institute or some form of nuclear arms decommissioning company or advocacy or something, is there is there anything we can do to generate or or at least try to create some of the futures that we may want or should we just leave it up to the folks who are at the forefront of these uh, industries, technologies or scientific innovations? I think potentially one of the most important things is keeping some of those folks in check some of the time. Yeah. Some of them do wonderful work, some of them go rogue and it's it's kind of hard to know who's who and what's what sometimes. But the idea of trying to be informed you know, we say this about a lot of issues. It's It can be a somewhat ineffectual nudge sometimes because we're suffering from a deluge of information. It's very, very hard to be informed about a lot of this stuff. But informed enough, I think, to understand the correct place of existential risks in policy mm. uh, and in democratic systems, I think that is of real value and a more informed populace that values existential risk mitigation, that truly understands how vast the, f- the potential of human and post-human futures could be and votes in that direction. 
I think that really can make a difference. That's the tricky thing about this idea of existential risk, because it's both a noun and it's a verb. So existential risk as a noun is the things, the list of things that could happen to us, whether it's nuclear war, AI, nanotech, asteroid, those are the existential risks that threaten humanity. But also there's the existential risks worth taking. Existential risk as a verb, the things that we should do as a humanity to mitigate against negative consequences. And I worry that we don't get the chance to propagandize the sorts of things that we should do. We spend a lot of time worrying about the things that may happen to us. So again, a victim of circumstance as opposed to allowing ourselves to feel like we have any stake in the game, which then leads on to that feeling of hopelessness, self-esteem crisis within humanity. But you said something quite revealing in your previous answer, which is this idea of a species in transition. In other words, we are already in a transhumanist era, whether we know it or not. So what does that look and, and feel like, I guess? How do we know that we're, we're floating within this uh, transhumanist era? And, and what do we need to do to, I guess, stay on that trajectory as we're currently in this transhumanist era? You know, there's a lot of arguments about the idea that humanity has always been a transhuman species ever since we picked up the first stone tools hmm. and invented symbolic language and did cave painting and engaged in storytelling. In some sense, we've all, always been augmenting our natural abilities by using tools to expand our power and reach over the natural world. I think that's basically true. But there's a big difference between stone tools and the modern technologies we have today. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that makes the 21st century a markedly transhuman era, a point where we are actually in transition, and I mean, you know, we're always in transition in some sense, but I mean paradigmatic phase change on the horizon here, is the idea that for the first time, post-industrial revolution, we've invented the technologies of the information age. Mm. We have augmented humanity with what is now effectively a global digital brain. We have 5 billion humans and counting connected to this mm. augmented intelligence, I suppose you could call it, and it is getting more and more intelligent as time goes by. I think the Google is the biggest AI company in the world, has the most data that is, you know, mining all of these insights into human psychology, into human behavior, into how, <laughs> into cognition. And that is getting more and more powerful at a really astonishing clip. Mm -hmm. So we've already felt the effects of this in ways that, again, to, to bring it back to that electricity comparison, that we kind of eye roll at as being really banal now. I mean, I'm if I hear another person, futurist, get up on a stage and be like, do you know the smartphone in your pocket has more computing power than something, something sent that <laughs> astronauts to the moon. 11, yeah, yeah. And it's like it's become such a dull factoid, and yet it, the true implications of it are mind-blowing. Mm. The fact that if, you know... 10, 15 years ago, you'd said to pretty much anyone alive today, in 10 years, you'll be walking around with a supercomputer in your pocket and, you know, you'll be glued, it'll be glued to your palm, that you will be crossing the road, looking at this thing, scrolling through these kind of digital, virtual, social landscapes where you're curating your identity and beaming it into cyberspace, into mm. these kind of uncanny valley visions of your ideal of personhood, we wouldn't, we not only would we not have believed it, so many people would have said, some weirdos might be into that, but not me, never mm. me. I'll resist. I won't be interested. And I think we can see abundant evidence, the same with the internet, that once we had high bandwidth internet mm. and it was democratized and became incredibly cheap, the lure of these technologies and the speed at which they become integrated into every part of the human global system, including now interfacing in much deeper ways with our cognition. We have AI that's built into our search engines and our emails and, and all the rest of it that is now preempting and predicting our thoughts, that is writing them before we type them ourselves. Mm -hmm. The idea that this is not going to continue to accelerate over the coming years and decades is, is frankly implausible to me. Now, that can sound 
extremely exciting with the right cadence. And it can also sound extremely terrifying with the wrong cadence. And it's always fascinated me that individuals like Steve Bannon with his online platform, The War Room, uh, warroom.org, they have a tab on his website dedicated to transhumanism. And it's all the sorts of things you've been saying, but emphasizing the negative consequences of those. So there's you know, a large percentage of the US and the Western world that sees transhumanism not as this wonderful egalitarian thing, but as a massive threat to our freedoms. And the idea of having something tracking you as you're walking down the street and you interconnect and, and, and go anywhere with this device, amazing, but also it can be used as a system of control. Again, it, it feels like the thing we keep coming back to in this episode, which is there's the good and there's the bad. Mm. Ultimately, transhumanism feels like it is at the cusp and it's constantly been at this cusp of this kind of PR crisis. So is there a way we can save transhumanism from co-option by individuals like Steve Bannon who want to communicate that it is the most evil great reset control mechanism over humanity that we are ever going to see? Is there a way we can reclaim it for collective good? I don't think so, (laughs) but I don't think it matters. Uh, I don't think it matters nearly as much. I'm not really interested in the meme wars. So uh Steve Bannon can say and publish whatever he likes. And uh-huh. I think it was you, Luke. But that, that, that means you're an evil globalist transhumanist. And that makes you one of them, Elise. Come at me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think Steve Bannon knows very well what he's doing. I don't think he believes a word of what he's saying. And he's very much tapping into a zeitgeist in America at this time uh-huh. of incredible middle and working class status anxiety and anxiety about their future livelihoods, cost of living in a more and more fractured society. And these are all like what he's speaking to are incredibly legitimate grievances and concerns, concerns that we should all be taking extremely seriously. The idea that we need to go in defending this meme, this word, this thing called transhumanism, or Mm. we should be afraid of even saying the word because there are a bunch of people that associate it with a kind of globalist new world order mindset, I just think is a waste of headspace. There is such a long, rich intellectual tradition and philosophical history attached to the word where it comes to academic scholarship and to delving into those scholarly ideas I am going to keep using the word. And Mm. if people want to brand me with pejoratives, they may. That's fine. Um, But the the grievances are hugely important because I do think this is something that a lot of people that are in the big tech world, for example, often don't do very well. Mm. I think they have these, these larger visions for the future and they're maybe in some sense comfortable with a degree of collateral damage there. And d- to be clear, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a macro historian. Mm. So if you look back on, on the arc of human history, there is no point in human history at which everyone was doing fine. In fact, for most of human history, nobody was doing particularly well. Mm. There is always, in a sense, quote unquote, collateral damage. There are always people who suffer and o- often in particular unique ways at times of revolution or transition. This should motivate any and all of us who care about building a bright future for humanity or its successes. The idea that we want to make sure these transition times, however they play out, and they may play out, you know, I might be wrong about a post-human future. They may play out with humans surviving hundreds of years into the future or more, sort of roughly as we are today with a few Mm. setbacks and then we claw our way back to where we are now and it's kind of this sort of plateau phase, maybe that's how it goes. But whatever the arc of the story, we should always be trying to mitigate as much of the damage, as much as the suffering of conscious beings, of, of human beings, as we can anywhere in the world. So the fact that there are swathes of people and it's you know, obviously the people in Western developed nations are not the people who are suffering most in the world by and large. Mm. And yet the fact that they're suffering in such profound ways with suicide rates increasing, with a mental health crisis emerging across developed nations, that is that is a very serious thing. 
And I think to speak brazenly in a way that makes people feel utterly steamrolled by the future, like they don't matter, like the job of the loss of their jobs and livelihoods to which they may have attached identity, Mm. sense of purpose, and also self-esteem and ability to support their families, for example. These are losses to which we need to be striving to mitigate. I think one of the ways that we are dropping the ball like crazy, particularly politicians and policymakers, is in the absolute imperative to overhaul education systems. The idea that we are still pumping children through a factory farm model and engaging in this now quite ludicrous arms race of higher education credentialism of Mm. over-credentialed people that are spending 25, 30 years before they enter the workforce at all. And then this is pushing out, you know, delayed ages of first marriage, childbearing, lots of other things that are interfering in a lot of the life scripts that people find fulfillment and meaning in. This is not good. And the idea that, you know, that the prominence that which exams take in the lives of young children today, Mm -hmm. the stress and pressure that it's attached to that, and the sense that meaning, identity, and purpose is cleaved to getting good grades, getting into one of the top colleges. I'm not saying there's no value to doing that, but the message that it's a one-size-fits-all model, model, that that is the only way to live, that is the only way to matter or be someone Mm -hmm. or live with dignity, that model has to go. And that is where our politicians and policymakers are letting us down. Well, it feels like if we're going to pursue a transhumanist future, then transhumanists need to learn to speak to the disenfranchised communities that feel like certain transhumanist technologies might leave them by the wayside. AI being the obviously the prime example is going to steal your jobs and sorry we don't have a solution for you. Apart from UBI, have you heard of UBI? Not just feel yeah. like, they're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're the, right. The, then it needs to not just be a, 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 a PR exercise, it also needs to be a um, communications exercise mm. in many ways to realise that there's collective advantages that may not be seen for decades. That's the other problem. It's like, yep. I'm sorry that you were born within this period of time, which is, to your point, the transitional period of time. You know, the, the future is uh, has the potential to be a lot better, but unfortunately the present that you're existing in right now is one of those transitional moments where we're still working out all the kinks from what we did in the past. So sorry, grit your teeth and bear it, which as you just said there, has been the history of humanity in so many ways. There's both winners and losers and the and the pathway to uh, hell is paved with good intentions. I I guess what you were saying there about reclaiming words. So there's transhumanism that uh, you're quite happy to reclaim. There's also another word you flirt with, eugenics. So are you not just a transhumanist, but are you also a eugenicist, at least? (laughs) Depends what other pejoratives you want to slap onto that word at the same time. (laughs) I think this has become an untouchable word, (laughs) which is why it's a word that interests me. Because like so many writers, like so many thinkers, I'm interested in and love language. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that there are words that we should ever really stick in the bin or make unmentionable. And it it kind of irks me that that is what has occurred with eugenics, and I, I absolutely understand the reasoning for it, and all the the very valid emotional force behind that. Mm-hmm. So obviously, eugenics dates back a few hundred years, and it's always really the the, the Greek meaning of the word is is good births. Mm-hmm. So it's the idea that basically we want children to be happy healthy, as unencumbered by forms of suffering, disease, ill health as possible. And I think this is this is really a kind of aspiration that almost all of us live by in the modern world. If you think about the prevalence of prenatal genetic screening, mm-hmm. the fact that you can just do a simple blood test now and screen for lots of heritable conditions. And, you know, the effort, the care, the money that modern parents and parents to be throw at anything and everything Mm. that might give their child an advantage in the world, whether that's teaching them sign language as kids or teaching them Mandarin or making sure they can play the violin. It's the idea that, 
in all sorts of ways, we are constantly trying to enhance the skills, the abilities, the prowess of our children in the world. But that's very much what we're programmed to do. They are a package of our genetic mm-hmm. potential toddling around. We, we not only want them to survive, we want them to thrive. So we're kind of wired for that. And so, you know, around the time of the world wars, particularly after the First World War, there was a lot of concern amongst humanist thinkers in Britain and Europe that uh, particularly thinkers like H.G. Wells, Julian Huxley, uh, J.B.S. Haldane, people who were working for UNESCO, who were thinking about uh, the prospect of a Second World War, and they were really, really concerned with the idea that there seemed to be a demographic issue where there were, I think as Huxley put it, basically too many children being born in the slums in these conditions of abject poverty Mm. where there was rising damp, more children than they could feed, terrible living conditions, and these cycles of intergenerational poverty, and not enough children being born to the well-to-do families who, once they got rich, kind of (laughs) paired back on their breeding endeavours and, you know, the slow life strategy you invest uh, just heavily in the one or two children that you do have. Mm. And he thought that this was sort of setting us up for a condition where there were so many people being raised in underprivileged conditions who that would struggle to pull themselves out of those conditions, that would struggle to get an education and then be the kind of informed citizens that would not allow such a thing like another world war mm-hmm. <laughs> to occur. And these thinkers meant so, so well. And it was, of course, you know, there's a distinction between liberal eugenics and coercive eugenics, the idea that we want to encourage people to have uh, to be able to have the freedom to choose great prenatal conditions mm-hmm. so that you can gestate a healthy baby and give it the best advantages and then coercive eugenics, which now we associate with, of course, Nazi Germany and the idea that we're in a very authoritarian way declaring from on high what sort of people should there be mm. and saying these these are these are the in-group, these are the out-group. <laughs> and, yeah, the, the after effects, I think, You know, it's also in in a sense been associated with Nietzsche. I think erroneously the idea that that Nietzsche's ideas were were co-opted by Hitler in in a sense Mm. and reframed really just as a maniacal pogrom and anti-Semitic campaign that has nothing to do with improving the character or the lot of humanity. Mm. But there was enough propaganda around the idea of, in a sense, making Germany great again, that the word eugenics has been, it seems, forever in the Western liberal imagination, been cleaved to this idea of Nazi atrocities and to the Holocaust. Mm. And I understand why there has been such a push, particularly throughout the 20th century and particularly in academia to want to signal boost rightly the disgust at that event, Mm -hmm. to affirm that we want to ensure that we live in a world where such an egregious violation of human rights can never happen again. But I don't think we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater because Hitler wasn't a man who was about good births. Hitler was a man about scapegoating a minority in order to boost his own political popularity and be an authoritarian leader. Most of us want good births for our children. I am totally receptive to the idea that many people would prefer just to use other other terms and just talk about prenatal nutrition mm. or whatever it happens to be. Some people like the the more futuristic designer babies idea of we're talking about genetic technologies coming into play in the future. But I don't see a need to throw words in the bin. I think we are we ought to be adult enough to distinguish the ways words have been co-opted and propagandized with their true meaning and their true intent and be able to apply them in different contexts in nuanced ways. So, so let me ask that question another way. What sort of people do you think there should be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not any type of person that I circumscribe as a model from on high. Let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got around that question. I, I, I mean, when we mention this idea of genetically modifying the human for the future, a lot of people argue for... You know, we need human diversity and we don't need homogenized humans. And I'm not talking just about the the look of human beings, but also their their ability to not have or to have certain diseases. And we say that certain things are bad, obviously, because of the way in which it 
inhibits living a healthy life. But again, we don't know what sort of human environment we'll be living in, and therefore we don't know if the human we're designing for today is going to survive the environment of the future. Yes, which is another reason to make these bioethical questions front and centre mm -hmm. of the modern human imagination. You're absolutely right. So like, we will have an enhanced potential to make choices, make tweaks, at, at least for single gene disorders. That's the first thing on the horizon, right? Editing out genes for Huntington's or cystic fibrosis. And I think most of us can converge on the ideal of like, yeah, it'd be, it'd be pretty good to have the ability to do that or at least have the option to do it. And I think that's always important that nobody commands from on high that you must engage in any genetic intervention, but you do have the option if you so desire. What's really interesting about that is again, as you say, the evolution of the environment, mm. of the niche, but then also the eight brains overlaid with that. So I think once humans start to get a very clever grand unifying theory or map in their heads, mm. they can get very stuck on that and think, look at look at how clever this is. Look, I'll just tweak this and I'll tweak that and it'll yeah. just be terrific and like nothing will possibly go wrong. It'll all be beautiful. And we usually do see that there are unintended consequences from tweaking complex systems. And what I really worry about, one of the things I could imagine, right, if we could, you know, this is maybe a long shot in the near future, but if we could start to tweak personality traits, I think that's introversion done and dusted. Hmm. I think most parents-to-be will select for high extroversion, high agreeableness, some version of your most prevalent human traits and most sort of pro-social, most socially revered, most conventionally rewarded traits. What we miss is that I think the lion's share of the greatest inventions and innovations <laughs> in human history have come from very introverted, very weird, sometimes slightly autistic people. If everybody's an extrovert, <laughs> who's going to design the AI? Correct. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's going to be the engineer at the forefront of saving us in the near future? That is the, the, key, the key issue. Another example I've heard is about cystic fibrosis, which is obviously a, a challenging disease to live with. If you have it, it's too much phlegm in the lungs. You have to lie on your back and have your back pummel to expel the phlegm uh, in your chest and in your lungs. But say, for example, uh, Yellowstone National Park exploded and we had all this ash and pollution in the atmosphere. All of these human beings with hyper-efficient lungs will <laughs> take that deeply down into their lungs and, and choke and die. But potentially those with the ability to capture some of that pollution in their throat and expel that pollution will be the future model for an idealized human. If we start designing and get Darwinist evolution out of the way, it presupposes a certain set of values about what we think it means to live a good life in the current environment we're in. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's, it's a far, far out example, but I definitely take the point mm. that as the niche changes, new things become adaptive and they go on to survive and thrive and become normative. Yeah. So why not then translate that very principle to silicon intelligence? Mm. Could that not be the thing that goes on to survive and thrive also? Well, this is where I wonder where you actually stand, whether it's we're going to become some form of cyborg. It'd be some techno-human hybrid. Or if you believe that human beings are just the, the uh, progenitor, I guess, of some form of future entity, whether that's some form of disembodied intelligence that exists on silicon, or if you think it's going to be a case that we continue to maintain our biological existence and just try and push the boundaries of death a little bit further and further down the road. Do, do you have a, a preferential future, I guess? Yeah. Audiences are, are always really keen to be like, give me the story. Characterize yeah, it for yeah. me. What's the, what's it going to look like? Yeah. Tell us. <laughs> what's going to happen? What's uh, going to happen? And it it's, can be really tempting at times to just lead with your dominant picture and overly signal boost that. But I have to pull back a little bit and say, 
multiple pathways are plausible. There are so many possible instantiations of post-humanity. There are many possible pathways to human level AI or to, to super intelligence that could come through biological avenues, that could come through digital avenues. Having said that, I will play ball. Uh-huh. <laughs> I tend to err on the side that digital intelligence will evolve faster than a digital biological hybrid. Mm-hmm. I just think this tweaking the biological system of the human is such a complex feat. Brain uploading, theoretically possible, but very speculative. Mm-hmm. And the precision that would be required for that is, is, is kind of mind bending. Whereas you can just start with a system that's got its own architecture, that it's got its own ecosystem, as it were, and that it can, you know, unlike us, all the classic cliches, it doesn't have to eat, it doesn't have to sleep. You are just mm-hmm. <laughs> packing computation in there. I suspect that if we reach and exceed human levels of intelligence in non-human forms, that silicon intelligence will be the dominant pathway. Mm. But some of those examples you raise, they they raise the question of thinking on different scales. And I think that's really, really important. So the idea of like, could we be in this mode where we're just sort of pushing out the human lifespan a little bit more, just adding a bit more better medical care, contracting that period of ill health at the end of life. Mm. I think that's eminently plausible because there's a really wide range of estimates for when we might see AI or super strong AI or super intelligence. And so, yeah, maybe we see it in 10 years, maybe we see it in 300 years. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, there's ample capacity for our current technological tools to intervene in their own sort of smaller feedback loops and uh, push at the limits of human cognition and human biological endurance without catapulting us into this kind of event horizon, singularity, intelligence explosion world. Well, the more of these sorts of conversations I have, I start to believe that it's going to be some form of forking future, whereby it's all of the possibilities all at once. And the the challenge is going to be having to deal with a society that has cyborgs with additional appendages at the same time as people have chosen to live in silicon, at the same time as we have people frozen in cryonics, which we do today. I mean, we deal quite <laughs> happily with the fact that they, they, they've frozen themselves. And all the multitude of possibilities on the spectrum from digital existence all the way through to some sort of elongated the physical, biological existence. That, I think, is going to be the true challenge because none of this happens in a vacuum and none of this will be prescribed topped down. At least that's the the hope. <laughs> you know, it won't be a case of, yeah. all right, we're all going to jump to the silicon now. Well done for the last <laughs> couple of thousand years. Um, line up, off we go into the uh, into cyberspace. That's the challenge. That's the political challenge. That's the societal challenge to not just flirt with the multitude of possibilities, but to take seriously the fact that they may come to pass. It's no longer science fiction. It's a it's a proper experiment in potentialities of world building. With that vision, I am desperately sad that you don't write science fiction because to (laughs) to be able to hold all of those things in your head gives me the sense that you may be able to actually characterize such a vision. And I think those stories are really, really important Mm. for humans to hold, as you say, multiple possibilities and multiple futures, these gradients of change in mind. I would love to see somebody render that in a convincing way. Well, there's the challenge to any uh, pioneering listener. And I do have to ask, because it's the Futures podcast, and I have to ask, how much do you think the decisions that we make today actually matter? Because after everything you've said about us being unintelligent, you know, meat sacks with eight brains, I mean, are we ever going to be the, the generation that creates a meaningful future that will ensure our survival? Or is are we going to have to rely on future generations or something completely alien from us? Oh, our decisions really matter. Right. The, the hard part to focus on, I suppose, is the reality that it's, it's the aggregate of all these tiny decisions mm. happening in parallel. 
again, the complex systems dilemma, that it's so hard for us to be this overarching strategist, playing God and moving the pieces around on the chessboard. We don't have that level of omniscience. So we are nudging the future in all sorts of different directions. But we're doing it, I would say, semi-consciously. It's not totally unconscious. It's not right, don't worry about it, we're drifting, Mm. we're not totally drifting, but the complexity of the decision-making we're engaged in is too much for any single human to keep front of mind, which reinforces that we need really, really robust institutions in this day and age. You mentioned the G word there. Is is the godlike thing here not human individuals acting like gods, but the fact that when human beings work collectively together, they can create something which ensures a collective future that feels a little bit like intelligent design, even if it doesn't have the same aesthetics as religion capital R. I don't think it just feels a little bit like intelligent design. I think it is intelligent design. Mm-hmm. There was, there's no evidence of any intelligent design up to this point in human history. I mean, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we might be the evidence. We but just refuse to accept it. Oh, I, if we're in a simulation, then we would have had intelligent designers. But if, uh-huh. if not, w- what form of intelligence designed you? It was, it was a blind force of evolution. That's the thing that I think scares transhumanists. The idea that there's something blindly groping around that accidentally led to us. And then we say that us is such this wonderful thing and we'll take it from here. It's like, well, the whole blind groping at different forms of biology and mashing different chemicals together got us this far. Why don't we allow for the continuation of that blind process? Because it did all right so far. Why, why do we feel like we have the human hubris to now take the reins? In a sense, this is the continuation of the same process. If you think about it as no. the evolution of information in the universe, mm. um, you know, Ray Kurzweil's version of this is, you know, you have these six epochs of evolution that yeah. information is encoded in atomic structures in simple forms in the early universe. Then, you know, you have, uh, you have biology, you have single-celled organisms, you have brains, Mm -hmm. then you get big human brains, big old human brains. That's just another way of storing and processing information, these memory computers that we've got in our heads. Then these memory computers seed computer computers. And that's another way of processing and storing information. And that system starts evolving. So you can say that the technology is subject to evolutionary laws as much as biology is, mm. that the most adaptive forms of technology get selected for. And in a sense, we're just the biological machines tinkering away, the gene machines that are assembling the techno machines, and evolution carries on. So, so you heard it here first. AI is completely natural because it was designed <laughs> by human beings that came from nature. Well, I mean, there's nothing in existence that's not natural. (laughs) So so it's all meant to go this way anyway, so let's just grit our teeth, uh, bear it, and uh, as you so wonderfully say, uh, the only way, I guess, is is through. Is that the case? I wouldn't say grit our teeth and bear it. Again, Mm. the only way out is through, and we will only make it through if we try really, really hard and we focus in a really concerted way in this tight time frame of this make or break century. So depending on where you put the emphasis, that is either deeply scary or wonderfully egalitarian. We're both in the same breath. <laughs> both in the same breath, the multitude of possibilities. And on that wonderful, weird, exciting and terrifying note, I just want to say thank you, Elise Bohan, for being a guest on the Futures Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Luke. Thank you to Elise for sharing her vision for the future of humanity. You can find out more by purchasing her new book, Future Superhuman, Our Transhuman Lives in a Make or Break Century, available now. If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.